Check one, two, check one, two. What's up, Wilton? <laughs> glad you're here, glad you're on time. <laughs> yeah, we about to get started and just go ahead and kick it in there. Uh, What's up, Helmet? What's up, Dave? Glad y'all came to check me out. Let me see. My bit race seems a little off. Hello. Glad y'all came today. About to get started. I'm talking about wireless today. I'm doing a little wireless class. Everything is wireless, so we don't get there. Okay. I'll look at that later. You got any questions? Uh, I always drop them in the box. As long as it's on uh, computer security, we can pivot to that. But like I say, uh, today is a wireless class. So I'm going to just start by uh, reading a quick article. Uh, NSA on wireless. NSA shares guidance on how to secure your wireless device. United States Security Agency, NSA provides uh, guidance on how to properly secure a wireless device against potential, potential attacks, targeting, especially when you're traveling and, and everything is remote, right? So most people usually use wireless, uh, even at home now with the laptops, you know, most things are wireless. You don't hardwire very often. The next day, recommendations are designed by uh, National Security Systems, Department of Defense, Department of Industrial Base, they all apply to remote. The info sheet published today by the NSA can help identify potential threats and vulnerable public connections, as well as minimize risks and better secure wireless devices. Cyber actors can compromise devices of Bluetooth, public Wi-Fi, near field communication, NFC, and short range wireless technologies. This puts personal and organizational data and credentials devices at risk. If the user must connect to a public Wi-Fi, they should take the necessary precautions, such as using a personal or corporate VPN to encrypt data. Of course, what's up, Kev Tech? I'm glad you're here. Let's go. So, uh, above avoid public hotspots. Everybody's aware of that. You know, when you go out. The new thing too is, and I should have put that in here, is when public charging stations are fraught with now. When you plug it up to charge, they're actually hacking you at public. Uh, Charging stations. That's the that's the huge deal now. Hijack wireless devices, including laptops, table, tablets, mobile, wearable uh, accessories, can lead to compromise of personal corporate data, such as credentials and sensitive data. To mitigate these risks, the NSA recommends avoiding public Wi-Fi networks as they expose uh, data traffic to manipulation, disabling Bluetooth. And NFS radios while in public, users should consider additional security measures, including limiting and disabling device locations, using strong device passwords. Before conducting business on a remote or public setting, you should obtain explicit authorizations from that organization. Uh, Earlier this year, the CISA also uh, released a device secure enabled uh, devices when traveling and urged precaution. So that's what we're going to hit. Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay, Wooden said he lost communication, so I'm trying to see if that's that's me or him. <laughs> so my stream says I'm good. So let me know if y'all have problems uh, hearing me. Happy Sunday. And who is um for y'all that's not aware of I I do federal security compliance for a living. That's that's my main job. So I've worked at DOD. I work with the IRS. I worked with OSHA. 
Uh, I worked with a lot of government agencies. So my specialty is federal compliance. So when I look at these checks, right, we're talking about checks. I use them on small business too, but we're going to go out high level checks for uh, federal compliance for wireless, uh, wireless lands too. So these checks will be for Cisco router, even your home router, what you're doing. Then we'll jump into the class, right? So everybody know I'm a STIG guy. STIG stands for, you can see it on there, Security Technical Implementation Guidelines. We're just going to go over, I think these were the top seven for a wireless network. Then we're going to go into class. Once again, if you got any questions or comments, cybersecurity, drop them in the box and we get at them. So, so if you Google STIGs and you Google the vulnerability numbers, these STIGs will come up. And so, so on the wireless lands, basic stuff, network element. Is not password to protect it. Network devices must be password protected. Network access control mechanisms interoperate to prevent unauthorized access to enforce the organization's security policy. I'll let you read the rest. Long story short, you got to have passwords uh, on those devices when you're setting them up. Like I said, I, I usually talk about Cisco because it's the 800 pound gorilla when you're in corporations, but these apply to anything. Group accounts are defined. Group accounts must not be configured for use on a network. Group accounts configured to use on a network device does not allow for accountability or uh, repudiation of individuals using a shared account. So basically, when you log into Cisco and configure it, you got to have your own account because if something happens under your account, I got to bring it back to you, right? That's what non-repudiation means is if you do some work on a corporate or federal <laughs> laptop, federal work, federal services, I just need to be able to trace any work you do to you. So even in, in Cisco, they don't want you to use the Cisco general accounts like root. Everybody just got to have their own user account. All right. What's up? Keep it techie. Glad you could join us. Device uh, is this with standard password. Device networks must not allow have any defaulted path manufactured password. Right. They always come. They tell you to change them. I go to a lot of sites, <laughs> a lot of big federal sites, and they still have a lot of the default passwords on there, right, which, which sounds crazy, All right? So usually, like I said, in this, the stick for wireless, I think there were 70 checks. We're just going to go over uh, the top eight. Like I said, then we'll start going over the, the class slides. An insecure version of SMP is being used, a uh, simple network management protocol. That's what you usually do when you... Uh, Logging to Cisco or any router uh, for management stuff. The network device must use SNMP version 3 security model, which is FIPS 140-2 validated for SNMP agent configured. Uh, SNMP version 1 and 2 are not considered secure without strong authentication and privacy that is supported by version 3. The FIPS 142 at a high level means that device is doing encryption. It sent the encryption into the government. The government reviewed it and signed off on it, right? So when you see FIPS 140-2 at a high level, that what it means. Because anybody say they can do AES. Anybody say they can do DES3. But if I program that myself, how do you know I'm doing it right, right? So well, that's why when the government says FIPS 140-2, basically, that's what that means, right? They send it out using default community names. The, def the, the network device must not must not use default or well known SMP computer community strings, public or private. The network device may be distributed by vendors pre configured with those in there, so people know what those are, right? So you just want to configure. Like I'm like I'm an Oracle guy. I've been doing those for years. So in the database, it used to always be Scott Tiger for the last twenty years. All right, so anything I wanted to test, I always tried username Scott and the password was Tiger, right? So that's what is uh, authentication required for the console access. The device must be required authentication. Uh, network devices with no password for administrative access via console provides the opportunity for anyone with physical access to the device to make configuration changes or enable them to disrupt your network resulting in a password. Because even when you go up to the... Uh, Computer security room, there'd be janitors in there sometimes, you know, they're watching them with cameras, right? You just don't want to let anybody wander in there and, you know, log into the management console. Uh, emergency administrator account privilege is not set. The emergency administrator account must be set to an appropriate administrator level to perform necessary administration function. 
when the authentication server is offline. So that's the big deal right there when the, when the authentication server is offline. The emergency administrator account is configured as a local account to the network device. It is to be used only when the authentication server is offline and not reachable via the network. All right. So basically, Active Directory is down or some authentication is down. All right. So then how would you log in the system? You would have to use a local account. And that's what the administration of accounts for. All right. So one of the security checks we do, if anybody uses the administrative account, it automatically uh, email gets sent to the security team because that never should be used. So if somebody's using it, if the site's down, security should know it, right? So if somebody's using it without the uh, site, being, the Active Directory being down or whatever the authentication for that is, whatever LDAP, if that's not down and people are using a local administrator, right? That's either a hacker or we don't know the site's down or some high level. So security team needs to get on that ASAP. Uh, the wireless LAN uh, must use EAP TLS, provide strong authentication. Mutual authentication with key distribution is not found in other forms of EAP period and thus provide significant more protection against attack than others' methods. Additionally, EAP TLS supports two-factor authentication on a wireless network, which provides simply uh, more protection than methods that rely on password or certificate alone. Uh, they talk about the DOD CAT and its authenticated service providing additional security. So when I do commercial, I do a lot of commercial sites that actually use these. They won't have a DOD CAT, right? So they won't have a DOD CAT card. So we substitute DOD CAT card with a uh, hard token. You can get the uh, token, especially by AWS. So you would use the password, your phone. Do you do the for the CAT card? We would use the uh, Google token. I think it's popular. You use a hard code USB, right? So that's triple security. Usually we only use that for the top admins using root on the box, right? So if you can get to root on the box, we want to make sure that box is physically locked down to the highest security that it possibly can be. Uh, once again, let me know. We can uh, start. Uh, it's not many slides in wireless. I think there's only 55. So. Last weekend, we went two hours, so hopefully we, we won't go to two hours today. But once again, if you got any questions on wireless or anything on uh, cybersecurity, let me know. This is a introduction class just to get your feet wet. Uh, they're going to touch every part of cybersecurity, wireless, VM, uh, database, uh, Purple Team, which is application development. So they're going to touch all those pieces, all those pieces so far. All right, so, that, so let's get into it. So like anything, we talk about security, wireless attacks. Several attacks can be directed against wireless data, Bluetooth attacks, near fear communications. NFC is usually when you touch your credit card to buy some, right? It's a small thing, it's wireless, that's NFC. All right, so a joke, what I did is, I downloaded an app to catch those communications and I left it by the pop machine on top of it. And I was actually taking people's credit card information while they were doing that. Right. So we was doing that as <laughs> as a small test at a, a local school. Right. So you can capture those communications if, if you if you were within, I think, uh, four or five millimeters where the pop machine, I could slide my phone right in the back of the slider so I could pick all that information up from near field on my phone. All right, so when I do, I very rarely do touch. I, I usually like to stick it in so you can actually read my 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 card, right, with that information. So when you use near field, just kind of look around, make sure there's nothing around that that could actually sniff your information, All right? Because I actually just picked up a couple of credit cards to see if I could do that on my phone by, like I said, being near field, All right? Because most people when they when they tap their credit card on the phone or use Apple Pay, they're not looking around. They're just so used to doing it. Right. So those are one of the tax. Radio frequency identification, wireless local area networks. Bluetooth wireless technology used for short range um, short range transmissions provide rapid de device pairing. It stands for Personal Area Network PAN technology, and it's a PicoNet. PicoNet's established when two 
Blue devices come within range of each other. One master controls all the wireless. The other device is slave task commands. Active slave sending transmission. The park slaves are connected but not actively participating. One of the big things that was when this actually came out was uh, exchanging information. People used to tap their phones to change business cards. That was one of the first cool applications that came out with that. So that shows you the PAM. You got the uh, master. Uh, AS is the active. Then you got the park slave. And the other one is just master with all active slaves. So the cool thing is now you can do so many technologies from that, you know, using a phone. Uh, Bluetooth attacks. Blue Jack an attack that sends unsolicited messages to the Bluetooth device, text messages, images or sound. Blue Jack is considered more annoying than harmful, no data is stolen. Blue snarfing is an attack that access unauthorized information from a <laughs> Blue Snarfing is an attack that access unauthorized information from a wireless device through a Bluetooth connection. Between the cell phone and laptops, an attacker copies email, contacts, or other data by connecting both devices without the owner's knowledge, right? And part of that um, bluejacking now, as I walk past a couple restaurants, I got a, a coupon for a discounted meal, right? They know you're in the area, and if the restaurant's not filled, right, they can say, okay, we're giving 70% off, 50% off if you come in now, right? But I don't know. So is that a benefit or <laughs> or an issue, right? Is that is that a hack of your phone, or is that them trying to get you to buy a meal and make it cheaper, right? Near field communication, a set of standards used to establish communication between devices with close proximity. When devices are brought together within four centimeters of each other, or tapped together, two way communication is established. Devices using NFC can be active or passive. Passive device channel contain information other than uh, devices can be read, but not uh, read or received from any uh, information NFC tag. An active device can be read as well as transmitted uh, information. Right. Some of those are tags on clothes. That's getting a lot cheaper. Uh, it's easier to you know, mark things with those devices because they're, they're super cheap now. So you can make it. So there it is with the uh, graph. So it's got the integrator, the magnetic field with the tags, short antenna. So usually it used to be on only on expensive devices, but now you can put that stuff on cheaper devices, right? Because it's dirty. What's up, blind guy? His wife and their guy I always come to class for the stories. <laughs> then so I was thinking, oh, always good, always good. So yeah, so if y'all didn't see my uh, internship from 1988, a lot of people enjoy that. I was doing um, tapes for IBM mainframe. Uh, the cool thing about that is uh, it's my first summer in intern and halfway to, through, my supervisor told me to my face, uh, I wasn't going to make it and she wasn't going to invite me back for the, for the next summer. <laughs> so I liked it because one guy in the comments called me the Moses of computers because he'd never seen a tape where you actually load tape up because back then there wasn't enough information. To put on an IBM mainframe in COBOL, you cut out a working storage section. So you put the tape in there. You tell the COBOL, I need a thousand records, which is going to be two gigs. So you would get it. But you couldn't have everybody's information on the mainframe at the same time. So you actually load it up on tapes. And the other weird thing is the room was about 38, 35 degrees. So you would be in there with parka, a skull clapping, skull capping gloves. So <laughs> it's real world, real life. Okay, NSC uh, uses automobile, entertainment, office, uh, retail stores, and transportation. NSC are used for countless payment attack, attack. I'm sorry, countless contactless payment system. A consumer can pay for purchase simply by attacking their card. We talked about that. Uh, automobile, you know, it's good. You got the NFC, but on top of the automobiles, right, you got GPS. You got self-driving cars. I'm actually going to do a video uh self-driving trucks. I think it's going to hit mainstream in five years. So that's going to be my next video. I was arguing with somebody about when autonomous trucks are going to hit the road. 
Uh, from a security perspective, of course, you could take over a Thomas truck and run over people and running into a building, right? From a cybersecurity perspective. And two, from a wireless perspective, Tesla, autonomous trucks, Waymo, all those cars, they get their security updates from what? Wireless transmission. That's how you update software for those vehicles, right? So if you can hack their wireless, take their update or put your own update in there, right? That could be malicious to that car, that truck from a security perspective. You could take over that device and turn it into a weapon. So from N NFC, from attacks, like we talked about, you can do eavesdropping. Unencrypted NFC communication between devices and terminals can be intercepted and viewed. Uh, data theft. Attacker can bump a portable reader to use a smartphone in a crowd to make an NFC connection and steal payment information on the store. Man in the middle attack. An attacker can intercept NFC communication between two devices to forge a fictitious response. Uh, device theft. The theft of smartphones could allow an attacker to use the phone uh, for purchases. Yeah. Um, so you take over somebody's phone. Now everybody got the cash app. They got a uh, PayPal. A lot of people, I'm weird. I don't connect my phone to my bank account. Now I got, I got my cash app and I do got PayPal, but I never log into my bank from my phone. I'm just one of those weird dudes. <laughs> I just don't do that. Right. Yeah, Gene, it's uh, scary out there. People just don't realize when you talk about cybersecurity, how many devices now, everything touches cybersecurity from your personal information to self-driving cars. Somebody actually hacked a I think it was the Tesla or Audi was moving and they were shutting it off, right? So there's just everything now is in cybersecurity. One of the hospitals, um, I live in Indiana, one of the hospitals got hacked and they couldn't take patients for a while. They actually had to go <laughs> to paper and carbon, right? And I was talking to the lady and she was like, they were down. They weren't down, but they were at minimal operations for six weeks, right? And they're still trying to figure out if they got the, <laughs> they got the nation state out. The other weird thing about that, and I had that on a, when I interviewed somebody, is HIPAA is a very weak security, so hospitals are the easiest thing to attack, All right? But from, from from my actual hacker cybersecurity thing, uh, besides it's colleges with FERPA and uh, hospitals with HIPAA, they're at the bottom. They're easy to attack, easy to take over, and um, it's just a weird thing. I still don't understand why we don't take up security unless it's more of a Costing, I understand the cost for colleges, but hospitals, <laughs> they feel a ton of money. So you would think their security would be at a higher level. We say blind guy and his wife, while well, see this working, I understand tapes even better than that relative, right, relative to the limitations of the mainframe. The war between Amemia was one with drunk. Oh, that's true. That's true. Um, Helmet made a good suggestion. And if you look, I think we did a drone attack and I think we killed some civilians this part of cybersecurity was actually drones. The first drones we looked at, if you go back, China actually hacked into the drones because the communication wasn't encrypted. So they were actually looking at where the drones were flying, what bases they were going back to because the <laughs> information wasn't encrypted in the transmission. I think we got that got that taken care of. But yeah, um, I always joke, Helmet made a good decision in there is our nerds are fighting their nerds. The first wars, which are still going on, are computer wars because they're easy. If you look at Pegasus, Pegasus' main attack was actually uh, diplomats' phones, taking over their phones, figuring out what they're doing and spying on them. Right? If you look at Pegasus, that was the first attack of that. Right? So people don't realize we we at war, and a lot of things we're not war. Keep your friends closer. They caught us uh, <laughs> taking over England's phones. Google that. We were we were actually spying on England, trying to figure out what they're doing. That's one of our closest allies for centuries was England. But watch your enemies, keep your friends closer, right? You want to make sure they're on your side. So cybersecurity plays in everything now. So especially the older I get, and now when you talk about autonomous transactions, people don't realize if you ever watch uh, the Will Smith uh, movie, right with uh, the Android, how I did a video, can't think of it or not. Those cars were talking to each other, right? As they were driving, you're going to have um, 
IOT in each car, so it's going to be able to get to cars within millimeters, right? And with that, they can figure out the friction of the road, how long they slide. So you're going to be coming in millimeters of each other when in the next probably 50 years when I, thanks, Gene, iRobot. I did a video on that, right? Um, iRobot, a lot of stuff is coming true, right? The time his cars, Will Smith want to drive his own car at 300 miles an hour, right? But if you remember, those cars were talking to each other and they were getting super close to each other, right? That, that's coming. Right, that's going to be the phase two of that. As you start getting autonomous cars, they're going to, like I said, start um, talking to each other. They're trying to, um, yep, hammer at the trucks and vehicles. Used to attack people before with humans. In fact, yeah, we've been attacking humans with cars for a long time, Helmet. Let's see. Uh, Gene, ransomware is absolute out of control. Oh, yeah. I I've given up on ransomware. That's just part of doing business. Uh, the weird thing is I was in a couple high-level meetings. The cost of cyber insurance is a crazy amount. I was super surprised with what they were asking for, cybersecurity. Helmet trucks and other vehicles used to attack people before and humans <laughs> will need serious cyber. Care. That's true. And now they're working on it. Um, Tesla and the big guys are testing the program. If you ever go to a lot of big conferences, one of the uh, things they talk about is IoT uh, cybersecurity and that includes cars and everything. So that's always a big section. Uh, Kev Tech, and oh, there, let's see what he's in the hospital. People, I know Kev Tech, that's crazy. People are still using Windows, so, yeah, it's crazy. But Kev Tech, you got any insight on why that is? Because my mom just passed away a couple of years ago, she was kind of really sick at the last 30 days. Her hospital was $300,000 for 30 days. Now, I don't know if they got all that from Medicaid and Medicare, but they got a big portion of that. So, Kev Tech, you got any insights on why hospitals are broke? <laughs> uh, blind Tech, this is why my husband says <laughs> we won't be driving self cars. He's scared. Uh, blind guy, his wife, don't, the only thing I push back on that is when you let the car drive, they said the next 10 years, your insurance is going to be almost zero because... It won't be you that's liable for the car. It's going to be a product placement. So if something happens, you get in the wreck, they're not going to sue you. They're going to sue the company. So a lot of people think um, insurance is going to go down to zero. Uh, once again, I'm going to do, I'm finishing up an article on autonomous uh, semis. And that's one thing I was surprised the guy argument said, oh, uh, insurance would never insure that. When I looked that up, the insurance, they're trying to figure out how cheaper to make because they believe 80 to 90 percent of the traffic issues are done by people, of course, because they're sleepy, they're tired. So they believe insurance is actually going to go down, not up. Shout out to Tiny. I'm going to interview him once I get my setup. I've been having problems interviewing. I probably need to reach out <laughs> to my man, Keep It Techie. I keep trying to use other software, but I think I got it. Uh, we're going to talk about his CISP he just passed. Let's say, damn, if any enemy gets hold of active drone. Oh, true, Helmet. Um, I think some of them, at least I know, got the uh, encryption because we weren't encrypting the traffic. So they were already doing that. It's going to be hard to give up control. Oh, facts, Jane. I'm going to be like uh, Will Smith. I'm going to be, people going to be flying in cars. If I'm still alive, I'm still going to be trying to drive. I'm I'm old curmudgeon. I don't like to give up control, but you know. But that's the cool thing, too, is I had to take my mom's keys. She was cool. I could be a hundred if the car gonna drive itself. I could just drop in the jump in the back seat, right? I can get to the. Well, I ain't gonna need to go to the grocery store. Hell, they delivering groceries now. But wherever I need to go, the car will drive itself, right? So I think that's gonna uh, enable older people to stay in their house longer with that. And two, if you look at the, uh, I did the Tesla bot. It's actually the iRobot Sunny that they're working on. This your Tesla bot's gonna help you when you fall down. Your Tesla bots. If I fall down and can't get up, the Tesla bot gonna come get me, right? If I'm there and some wrong, the Tesla bot's gonna be uh, wired to my Fitbit. So if my heart start fibrillating, right, my Tesla robot, a call nine one one, take me out the car, put me in it. It's gonna drive itself to the hospital, right? And they just gonna take me out the car, right? Between the Tesla bot <laughs> and self driving cars, you be you be able to stay home almost to. So you really need a nurse. And I think the Tesla bot, they hope can do some general, you know, take your stuff, make sure you get your shot. So I think, you you know, if you look in the future, because I'm 53, I'm getting old, you know, uh, keep it techie, Kev tech, all the young guys up in here, you know, Dave W, they're going to be running it. You know, I got about another 10 years. I'm going to be just hanging out with the Tesla bot. <laughs> Let's see what we'll say. 
Uh, this is me laughing at the traffic cop. Once more, Morty Mons can't make those self driving cars. But that's true in the real. Life. That's true. That's true. But like, what, what is funny is now if the car is driving, it's not going to speed. It's not going to go through a red light. It's not going to change without a turn signal. So a lot of that little stuff, a lot of your road rage is going to be down, right? You're going to be mad at the car because it's only probably going to drive 30 in a 30, right? <laughs> so that's what you're going to be mad at. But I think those are some things of the future. Those are some things we're going to explore in my channel. We're going to explore from the technology. And once again, I always put the cybersecurity, like I said, to an autonomous semi it gets all its updates wireless, right? So if it gets hacked or taken over, we're going to be running over people in semis. Yeah, lots of implication kidnapping, CEO, celebrity, cyber cutie is definitely getting better. Yeah, true. That, that's a big thing Helmet brought up is it's going to be interesting to see what 5G is going to bring. Um, and I tell people, I don't want people surprised like a lot of the um, cab industry got surprised by uh the cab companies, right, that you can just order up on your phone, right? They pass those laws, right? So if people don't realize, if you went to New York, a medallion was worth a million dollars five years ago, right? Now, I can order a Lyft or Uber. Those medallions now are not worth a million. I think they're worth like maybe fifty or $60,000. People bet their retirement on medallions being able to sell them to somebody else. Or somebody drives their cabs and they get profits until they can pay that medallion off, right? The sad part about it is cab companies have to pass all these checks, all these things. They didn't make Uber and Lyft do half of that. So they just took that old industry out. You cab drivers in the 80s used to make eighty and $90,000. Now, those are crappy jobs because you're working long hours. But a lot of um, my homies' parents, because I work with a lot of people around the world. If you're in IT, especially cyber, I work Russians, Indians, everybody, right? Their parents made a living on cab driving. That that industry now is about done. I mean, you could do it as a hustle, but you can't do it as a full time job anymore, right? It makes it hard. Like my uncle does it as extra pay. He goes out and tries to make a couple hundred dollars a day, but people used to make a huge living after that. Uh, Gray Fox hospital CIOs are not spending the money to be updated. Uh, CFOs too. Uh, Gray Fox, I'm just not confused. Where if you're negligent, like Kev, you using Windows set Seven as a cybersecurity guy, that's negligent. I will have my lawyer sue your lawyer. All right, if I get hurt and you run a Windows Seven, you're negligent as a CIO, CFO. And a CISO, right? Who's in charge of security? So that that that's really weird for me. Like I, I know you have at least ten good years left. So I don't know, but like I had a rough life, man. I, I grew up in the hood, blind guy. I majored in dog years, man. I had a rough younger life. We gonna see, blind guy. We gonna see, man. I got a new job assistant, man. So I'm trying to learn and get used to my job. Once I get comfortable, I'll be. Probably still cyber fear hours. Oh, that's cool, Kev Tech. Come on up. I'm going to do this is intro to cybersecurity. Like I said, it's, it's really a 16 week course. Uh, each one touches a different uh, segment. VMware. If you, if you go back, I'm actually putting them in a playlist. Uh, so we can actually do it. I think I'm, I'm, de I'm debating. If I, I also teach uh, beginning forensics. So when we get hacked, you got to go in the logs, figure out what happened. Somebody tries to steal, which this just happened recently. They took the SSN and embedded them in an in a image. So you would actually have to go on the image and pull the actual SSNs out the image. There's actually uh, uh, spots and images that are not used where you could put push data in. So I'm thinking about maybe teaching the beginning forensics class as my cybersecurity. But come on, Kev Tech, we welcome you to the cyber game, man. That's true. It would be amazing for this. Yeah, Gene, I think there's some stuff coming. Um, just like I said, with my mom, she had the little uh, thing around her neck that she could push. Then, you know, you could actually put cameras inside people's houses to watch them. And like I think the Tesla bot, there's a lot of, you know, things coming. What's up, B-Dub, peace? Oh, you are 100% right. Uh, Helmet brought up prosthetics as a, from a medical advice. You are correct. I'm just thinking from a cybersecurity perspective. But that's even cybersecurity. Uh, you're right. I think if you look at some of the, uh, what's that movie with, uh, they had the uh, military, they actually had the things on their legs so they can run faster. The guy got, he kept 
getting killed every day. I got to think of it. But, you know, they had stuff on their legs so they can run quicker, jump higher. So he's right, uh, prosthetics. And if you actually look from a cybersecurity thing, one of the pacemakers were actually getting updates wirelessly. So they it wasn't secure. None of that information going to pacemaker was actually uh, encrypted. If you want to Google that to double check me. But yeah, so they were scared that people would actually give this guy a heart attack if they actually took over the pacemaker in his chest. right? So it was kind of cool. It was wireless and updated. But then if you don't secure it, right, theoretically, I could I could kill you. right? I could cut off your pacemaker, make it, you know, pump your heart up too quick or shut it down. Okay, if tech uh, can't be father time. Oh, facts, man. That's I can't never be father time. I'm just trying to hope father time is easy on me, Kev Tech. AI, AI will mostly likely speed up medical breakthroughs. Oh, that's true. And uh, I'm going to talk about that too. Uh, Helmet brought up artificial intelligence. We got to think about that from a security perspective because a lot of stuff we do in cybersecurity, right? Artificial intelligence is, is actually going to start doing stuff like that. Um. I think I got that in one of my slides where uh, Amazon actually has a utility service called Macy. And Macy basically says, this is your setup. It scans and says, this will pass a HIPAA setup. This will pass a FISMA, which is a DOD setup. This will pass a FERPA, right? So Azure and Amazon are putting those services up to assist you, right, to hopefully stop you from getting hacked. But as it assists you, right, I'm going to need less networking people. I'm going to need less DBAs. I'm going to need a little less cybersecurity, right? I'm going to just need you thinking at a higher level on the pyramid. We talked about automation, right? I don't need a bunch of SAs. I need a couple good ones because Amazon is going to spin me up 50 BMs as long as I pay my credit card, right? Amazon is going to spin me up, you know, um, they spin you up one big database, and it's, it's called schemas. They spin you up all these schemas to put your tables in and do work in, right? That's automation, right? So now I need less of that, but I needed to be more thoughtful, more intentional, being how am I configuring my system admin to put my VMs properly? Because if you do Windows, I still got to have my GPOs. I got to make sure they're secure. But once that's baseline secure, right, I just spin them up. I don't build them. I just spin them up, right? If I bless them from the security team and they say they're good, right? All this automation. I need less people. I ain't going to say I need less people. I need different people. I need automation people. I need security people. I need, uh, I think Kev Test said he's getting his Azure on. How does that work? Right? That's a different skill set. Right? Let's see. Yeah. How's it easy? How easy it is to self-hack, self-driving car? Oh, ring doorbells, yeah, all that. Uh, I think cars are a lot harder, Gray. Um, the reason I think they put a little more thoughtfulness into it, and since it's kind of like a ten year, ten year run, but let's be crystal clear. Let's not make a mistake. It's going to be harder, but not impossible. All right. So I always remember Lex's advice. Oh yeah, so yeah, Gray. So let I think it's going to be harder, but not impossible. I fought when oh I fought Windows 10 for so long just because of all the updates, but Windows 7 has been dropped. <laughs> now that's true. But like uh, Kev Tech said, I know smaller customers and a couple of my friends or um, got small business. They still running Windows 7. So I mean, a lot of people, you know, Windows 10's got a lot of features. It's a lot harder. And two is if you don't have the money or time, you you worrying about the features and getting money. You're not worrying about Security your system until you really get hacked. Especially if you admit to small size business, you always think the hackers are going to go to a bigger company, right, to get you. I Jim, he won't want to get mad at me when I think all facts. Kev, now and that's my big problem. Kev Tech says to G, people will get mad at me when I updated from Office 2010 to Office 365. I educated 250, right? Uh, and that's always a big Kev Tech hit it right there. Is when you go to update even when you even when you go put on just security features people are scared you're gonna break something people are scared they're gonna, you're gonna have to do something different especially as a security team we say okay we need you to do email like this right they've been doing this way for 10 years but we tell them this is more secure and it's but so the learning curve the update and my management team's excellent originally when we first got there 
anything I try to make them do, they would run the management and management would call us in the office and we had to explain why we were doing something. Why? They don't want you to mess up the money. They don't want you to stop stop production, right? But when you get hacked, though, everybody going to blame you. But So you got to weave that in and how that's going to operate. <clears throat> Hell, but I mean, imagine having better uh, clock tech, smile and light of devices on the ground and space. Oh, that's that's all that's coming, right? Uh, space exploration is, oh, true, because billionaires are getting to it, right? Billionaires put a lot of money into it, and people don't realize um, the microwave, there's so many technologies just came for us trying to live and cook in space, so it's going to be interesting, especially when you got uh, uh, Elon Musk, he takes a rocket, shoots it up, brings it back down, flips it over, and lands lands that on a barge, right? So all the technology into that, all the GPS into that, do you know how pinpoint you have to be to land a rocket on a, on a barge, right? So just the technology is coming in there because I'm old enough to remember uh, Garmin, which was self-driving. You have to pay for it. your Google Maps is what they're going to use for autonomous. Look how good this is getting. Uh, five or six years ago, it used to miss my exit. Now it'd be like, oh, if you have a thousand feet, please move over to the left two lanes, all right? I work in an eight-story building. It knows for some my Google Maps knows that I work on the second floor. So what how does it know? It asks me if I want to ask questions for certain business on the second floor that I'm at. Right. So it knows what levels I'm on. Right. So technology is getting so much better. When those seven is going in the 10 scares people. I guess I'm older than the technology, so nothing uh, scares me, especially those that use seven. Right. Eleven's <laughs> here now, so you got to keep up. Come on, Helmet. You just updating the 10. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> we had a train officer do it. Oh, never care. <laughs> no, nah, facts, facts. But no, nah, that's true. Like I said, Kev Tech in the, in the building, always dropping nuggets. But that training and upgrading is, is a huge fight sometimes. And two is if we do a security review and we add extra security and if it breaks up, oh, my God, they're coming to see security. Did we do a double check? So we got to make sure we got our, we got early adopters, uh, dev, uh, UAT, pre-production and production. You know, we trying to test it in all these levels to make sure, to make sure we get it right. All right. Cause if you break anything, Kev Tech, if he breaks anything on an update or getting off his 365 or that, 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 uh, transition doesn't go smooth, they're going to come see you, right? They're going to pull up on you. All right, so back to the slides. We got eavesdropping, data theft, man in the middle, and device theft, right? All of that applies to autonomous cars when they're getting updates and stuff for their car. Right? Those are different ways to attack those updates. <clears throat> Radio frequency identification, RFD, commonly used to transmit information between employees and identification badges, inventory tags, book labels, and other Paper-based tags that can be deleted from proximity readers. Most RFD tags are passive. They do not own their own supplier power supply because they do not require power supply. They can be very small. The tags are susceptible to different attacks. Current versions stand known as Generation 2 contain some security enhancements over the previous version. Over the RFD attack, unauthorized tag access, a rogue RFD reader can determine the inventory of a store's sales to track the sales of a specific item. Fake tags, authenticated RFD tags are replaced with fake tags that contain suspicious data about products that are not in the inventory. Eavesdropping tag, unauthorized users could listen in or communicate between the RFD tag and the reader. Wireless LAN is designed and replaced or supplement a wireless LAN. It's important to know the history and specifications of IEEE, hardware necessary for a wireless network, different types of wireless LANs directed at enterprise home and user. So every company you go to now has a wireless LAN. You log in, they usually got guest accounts for your guests and your salespeople or, you know, uh, your people you're doing business with that just want to check on their email from their company. So not most people have wireless network, even the corporations for their guest users. Right? Uh, in Institute of Electronics, Electrical and Electronic Engineers, 
IEEE, most influ influential organization. I mean, they're still uh, pretty active to this day, IEEE. Dates back to 1884. I'm going to fly through these. Uh, began developing network ar architecture in the 1980s. 1997 released IEEE 80211, standard wireless network, higher speed 5 and 11. Add in 1999, IEEE 802.11b and 802.11.8 specifies maximum speeds up to 54 using 5 gigahertz spectrum. Uh, IEEE 802.11 preserves stable and widely accepted 802.11b standard. 802.11n came out in 2009. Improved speed, coverage area, resistance to interface and strong security. 802.11ac, ratified in 2014, has data up to 7 gigabytes. And that's the list. Uh, 5G is there, 7 gigabytes. Tells you the thing. The weird thing is how many people actually did have the uh, modems in their house with their phone. I remember having a 88 baud in my house and... I was doing some work, and I was still living at home when I was 25, and I used to tell my mom, she couldn't pick up the phone, right? Because if you picked up the phone, that would disconnect your connections. So y'all y'all, young, y'all got the always on, fiber to the house, speed of DSL, and fiber connection. I remember the 88, and it, you could hear it down on your phone and connect it to the office, right? So it's just, I should have got a video of that. I remember when I first got that in my house, and somebody gave me a laptop to work from home. I thought that was the coolest thing. If anybody picked up the phone, which was hardwired, right, it would break your connection. That lets you know how quick technology have. And, you know, that's my, I got probably 35 years in the game. So that lets you know from a device dialing the number, connecting to where we are now, right? We're talking about 5G, autonomous, um, Soldiers fighting each other. Just, you know, it's going to be so interesting to know what's the next, what's the next 10 years going to provide, right? Uh, Let's, I'm still on Windows 7. Come on, Let's, let's go, man. Yeah, the blame before I see we get thrown on the bus. Make your test everything before. I care tech telling y'all, man. I, I done broke a lot. I don't, not a lot of things. I broke a few things in my life that I almost got my ass fired. So <laughs> make sure you test that stuff. Make sure you go. And hopefully we never try to be the first thing in any technology, but stuff always happens in this stuff, right? Uh, AKA, AKA iCloud activator lot. Okay. I'm going to I have to look into that. But does anyone here have, does anyone here play games using a virtual machine? I remember that. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I'm with every weird sound. <laughs> Man, that dialer where you could click <laughs> get a sweep to come back up and the page might still load. Yeah, that somebody was going through what they were going through each kind of two or three years where they first buy a modem. If you would download a song that you would got from uh, Napster because you were still a music, the song could take eight hours to download to get the whole song. So I would you download two songs and go to bed while they were downloading, right? So each year it was like a song would take two days and then it was like a day then it's like now you could get a song you know if you got fiber you can get it in a you know 15 seconds 10 seconds right so that just lets you know the pace of technology i gotta find that video where they were showing stuff but yeah it's just come so far i remember downloading software it would actually tell me it would take 48 hours man so you would try to download it from home and you would just like let it run all night just hope hopefully nothing messed your connection up now, you know, you can download stuff on your phone and just nano. So the weird thing is now you don't even download music. You just stream it, right? Unless you, you know, don't want to stream, you download a couple of songs. But most songs now, you just stream it. See, an internship from hell three days ago. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. I'm glad you like it. I it but yeah, those are stuff, you know. I'll be now, I'll be signing back in my day. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, wireless hardware, wireless client, network interfaces and adapters perform same functions as wireless antenna sends and receives uh, through airwaves. Everybody seen those. Access points, major part antenna radio transmitter, uh, receiver sends and receives wireless uh, signals, bridging software interface wireless devices to other devices. 
wire network interface allows it to connect by uh, cable to standard wire network. Access points, access a base station for wireless networks, access a bridge between wireless and wire networks, can connect to wire uh, network by cable. So there's the picture of it, but it's just, like I said, once again, just technology is flying by. I could be fresh even when I was lying guys around. Like, that's that's going to be me, man. That's definitely going to be me. So it's just, you know, like I said, when I when I actually talked about in my uh, internship in 1988, just, and I actually shows a picture of the uh, the IBM tape machine, it, it just kind of hit me. I'm like, man, we went from that to this. All right. And I remember being. 14 or 15, and my aunt came from a small town in Beulah, Mississippi, and she never seen a touch tone phone. I want to say this is 1978, and she's from a small town. It was like, y'all never even heard a show called Marbury. She actually picked up her phone, which is rotary, and they knew her because she was all the operator in her town would connect her to another person in her town because they still had operators that could switch you into somebody else's phone. So she would pick up the phone. They said, I want to talk to Kev G down the Kev, Kev Tech down the block. And they would just click her in. She wouldn't have to dial, right? So that was amazing to me. And I remember that 15, like, it was just weird. She was like, I don't know how to operate this phone thing, right? And it's two is they showed two kids trying to, uh, what was it? I think it, was it a phone or was it? I think it might, oh, it was a tape cassette. I think it was a, I think it was a, just a cassette tape and they've never seen one. And watching kids look at a cassette tape. It was some. I think it was a cassette tape. They couldn't figure out what it was for. Right? So it's just so stuff moved. And then kids, doesn't even, they don't even know what, what that is anymore. Let's <laughs> see. Blind guy, she has the original. Yeah, it's, it, it was, I just never forget that. And I just laughed because she said the big city. But two is... Uh, I remember I was teaching the mainframe guy because they were struggling with relational databases. They were going from RPG, COBOL to Oracle. Um, SQL Server was just coming out and some of the uh, relational database. And I did that in college, so I picked it up. But then I want to say uh, probably about 10 years ago, I tried to pick up Java and it was object oriented. I was struggling and I finally clicked and, you know, I got some help and I was doing some stuff. But I was like, man, I had to send a shout out to the <laughs> mainframe guys. I was like, I know I know how y'all feel now because going from relational to object oriented was like this huge leap uh, for me. Paradigm shift. Number one is I do relational databases. I understand the math behind it. I have a computer science degree. That's my first love. But object oriented was just so fundamentally different. To me, I was like, man. So me picking it up and me figuring it out, and I, I've actually did some programs for DOD and other people. But that learning curve, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna have to apologize to the mainframe. Shout out to Kev Tech. Java is hard. It's not something easily picked up. Um, I right, said so it took me a while. So here's a uh, wireless LAN. We got the wireless network from the uh, network. We got the file server. We got the desktop. My man Helm is still at two. Uh, he still at the older version. We got to get him updated. Then we got the laptop. We got to get that updated. Then we got the wireless devices, right? That's the access point where those two are actually, you know, sending connections to the uh, information to the access point, the AP. The wireless using the access point in the, in the operating infrastructure mode. Network that are not using access points in an ad hoc mode. Device can only communicate between themselves and cannot connect to another network. Uh, the Wi Fi Alliance has created a similar technical spe specification called Wi Fi Direct. Residential uh, wireless uh, LAN gateway used by small offices or home users to connect to the internet. Focus include access points, firewalls, router, dynamic host configuration, DHCP, which I'm not a huge fan of. And others, right? So in my home office, you know, I got a firewall. I got some other devices, you know, some minor stuff. Um, trying to control my traffic, kind of control if anybody try to hack me, right? But <clears throat> wireless enterprise attacks, right? We know it. big companies are getting attacked. Everybody's everybody's on it.
Oh, uh, yeah, let's pause the roulette. With everybody's work from home, or the majority of people work from home, your home router, unless you're getting the updates, unless you're getting the firmware, unless you're getting uh, all the updates and the security patches on it, right? From a cybersecurity perspective, that's the big hole when you work from home, right? Even if you VPN a lot of times, if I can get your router to your router and connect it, I can block your VPN from getting to your office, right? So from a cybersecurity perspective, uh, that router is a huge <laughs> hole in the infrastructure when you work from home. So let's hit the wireless enterprise attacks and network well-defined boundaries protect data and resources. Boundaries known as a hard edge. The introduction to wireless land is enterprise has changed hard edges into blurred edges. Type of wireless attacks, and we're going to look at those in the diagram coming up, is rogue access points, evil twins, intercepting wireless data, wireless replay attacks, and denial of service. Right? So when you use your wireless, even in the office, even if it's secured by your Cisco team, right? Those are still ways to attack it. And I'm always surprised too is uh, you have consultants, they just spin up um, their phone and they're sharing connections using their phone. So a lot of times you got to say, okay, you stealing something? <laughs> are you tethering to your phone, which is cool, right? But from a security perspective, what are you sending through that phone? Because now you're bypassing the corporate network. You're not using our wireless and you're not using our wired LAN. Right, so I can't see what you're doing when you use your phone to tether and connect to your office. Right, so you can't buy experience sooner. The sooner you learn, less time left to grasp. Oh, uh, that's true. The cool thing about being old is it always stack on each other. So if you keep up, you don't have to learn as much. Right, so I did a little COBOL, did a lot of uh, relational database. So then when, if you look at NoSQL, is this different type of databases. I could learn that because I understood the last two, right? So that makes it easier for me. I don't have to learn as much. So when I look at AWS or Azure, I've done networking on-prem, right? So now I just got to take that experience. Is how do you do that in AWS, which is VPC, controlling your traffic, right? Uh, security groups, which are... Uh, <coughs> Logical firewalls, right? Ingress and egress, right? So I understand all that on prem. So when I go to the cloud, right, I just gotta pick up the, the cloud terminology and pick up the cloud services, right? But let's not make any mistake about it. And Kev Tech can sign off on that. When you look at Azure and AWS, they have so many services now. It's mind blowing. I'm usually AWS, but I, Azure is catching up. I mean, they have hundreds of services. And let's just try to pick all those services up. How do they work with each other? You know, how they build on it. It's still a daunting task, but I understand the basics, right? And I think Kev Tech, uh, keep it techy. If you, if you got the basics right, you're just stacking on top of your basics. All right. So that's the hard edges. This is a corporation. You got your internet, uh, got your firewall, which is your single point of entry. I got my application firewall. I'm using my Cisco. I'm looking for certain attacks in that firewall. As I go on that single point of entry, right, I got my network devices. I'm watching traffic. I can see who can go to desktop, who can go to corporate, who can print uh, another desktop. I got GPOs on that from the stick perspective. I got my Windows 10. I work with Kev Tech. Make sure it's hard. These are the 300 checks I got on Windows 10. I want to make sure they're locked down. Right, how we can communicate, what browser we're using, what IPs we're gonna let go through these browsers, depending if that desktop is in your protector zone. There's only certain things we're gonna let you do in a protected zone. Protected zone on the, on the desktop. Protected zone for us is where your web servers, app servers, and databases are. At, right. You gotta do a little admin work, but you won't be able to get to the internet. We're gonna block a lot of stuff, right? We just want you doing your job back there because. <laughs> You click on something, you can take the whole organization out, right? Shout out to Maddox. Glad you could make it. So here is the network blurred edges uh, diagram, right? So what do we mean by blurred edges, right? Um, I'm a professor in real life. Most people know that. So when I roll up to class, a lot of times I'm in a parking lot. 
right? When I look on my phone, I can see the school's access points, right? It's blurred edges. I'm not in the wild. I'm not wired, so it's blurred. I'm two blocks away, and I'm picking up the school network, right? So if I can pick up the school network from the parking lot, I can do what? I can attack the school network from the parking lot, right? Two blocks away, right? So it's good and bad. It's cool. You know, we wireless students are jumping on working, but if I don't set it up properly, two blocks away from that's a little far, right? I could be, you know, down the street. Uh, trying to do a man in the middle attack and we can, we can walk. Let's walk through the internet. You can get through the network device. You got the access points. You can inject, uh, infectious, uh, malware behind the firewall, the laptop at the top, right? I'm in the parking lot two blocks away. I'm trying to inject stuff behind the firewall. The other attacker network at the bottom. I'm listening to data. I'm trying to do man in the middle attack. Some students not thinking. He's not listening to me in class. He's trying to buy Amazon, so now I done stole his credit card, right? He should have been paying attention. I did a man on middle, now I'm stealing his credit card, right? So those are the blur edges right there on the plan. And attackers can attack you, of course, you know, from the parking lot. I don't have to get in. I don't have to break anything, right? That's your network, and you're giving me access to it. <laughs> I'm a Google Cloud, think doing a rabbit. Oh, true, slowly getting it. Oh, that is true. I'm actually, I got a uh, Google pre-engineer guy. I used to work for a big uh, database company I used to work for. So he's actually going to come on my platform. We're going to talk about security. Um, I did a security review of Google uh, about five years ago. Uh, we were going at it. I think they are a great company. I think they're number three. For me, and I think they're finally doing it, is a lot of the young guys was super smart, PhDs. They just didn't know how to do government security. The cool thing about government security is it's very, what that guy told me, it's very prescriptive. It tells you, and I showed you some of the checks, it tells you exactly what to do. If you go out there and Google that, it'll tell you specifically how to set that check up in the wireless land. It's specifically going to tell you what's in that GPO right so they're going to be two, three years behind. But Google was so smart. They didn't want to do government checks. They said they were outdated. I'm like, dude, I'm at a government site. I got to respond to FISMA. I got government agencies that don't review this. So if you can't perform this the way we need to perform, we can't work with you. Right. So they actually had a um, lobbyist go see my boss and actually <laughs> talk about me in a negative light. Right, because Google got a ton of money, so and they got lobbyists. Right, so that was my only issue. And to be honest, they actually hooked us up with some people. They actually got their the uh, cloud upgraded with the uh, FISMA stuff we needed. But they actually true story. And I'm actually bringing out. They actually have a lobbyist come talk about me. My boss was cool though, because you know I've been in the game for a long time. He was like, if that's what we need to pass the audit, that's what we need, right? So. See, Kev, definitely good to learn. Same with Google to support course. People are sleeping on it. If you're new to it, it does help. Yeah, I think Google's it. I think uh, Google's right there. I think they're going to get some of that Jedi money. Uh, the government gave a $10 billion contract to Microsoft. Uh, Trump did that. A lot of people were <laughs> a little up in arms. So now the new administration came in. They're going to uh, give that product to about 10 uh, large cybersecurity. One thing, it helps the United States spread that money out so those guys can buy equipment, uh, get the people, hire their people, right? So the big three are going to get most of the money being Azure, AWS, and Google. Then you're going to have Salesforce pick up a nice chunk of that. I'm sure Rackspace is going to get it. And that's going to, the last probably 500 million gonna get spread out by four or five super small vendors, but the big dollar is gonna eat well. And I'm with the Oracle in there. I'm a, I'm a huge Oracle guy. They actually been working on their um, their cloud offers offering, so I think they'd be in that probably that second tier with Salesforce. I can see Oracle in there getting some of that 10 billion dollar Jedi money over 10 years. Uh, let's see, rogue access point, an unauthorized access point that allows an attacker to bypass network security, usually set up by an insider, maybe set up behind a firewall opening of a network to attack. Evil twin, an AP uh, set up by an attacker, attempts to mimic an authorized access point. 
The attacker captures transmission from users to the evil twin. <clears throat> so that's another slide. Let's see what we got. Um, yeah, I'm doing the, yes, I did the analytics from them. <clears throat> that it's uh, support course is one I'm checking. As Professor Black Ops said, if you learn from um, true facts, uh, Professor, did you ever touch negotiation salaries in tech? I have not talked about that, Hellman. Um, <laughs> I see if Tiny's in the room. <laughs> I work with him. He's going to be in there. Uh, yeah, I could talk about that. For me, Hellman, with um, Glassdoor and that, and then I got people in the industry, so I kind of know what certain salaries make. So I'm kind of at a point in my life where this is what I want. If I can't get it, I'm going to go somewhere else. But as, as I was younger, I, I, I always undersold myself. I'm, I'm going to be honest. I always undersold myself. Um, a lot of times I had the skills, but when you walk in, like when I first walked in the DOD, I was like, okay, I got it. I think I'm going to be successful. But I was scared to negotiate a higher salary because I didn't want to talk myself out of, out of a position. Right. So I, I wasn't quite at... um imposter syndrome because I, I knew I was going to be successful from a skill side, but from a salary uh, profession, you know, I was always kind of like, well, I don't want to ask for the most. I, you know, I always just kind of put myself in the middle, you know, I put myself in the middle. Right. So, but yeah, Helman, I, I, I will, I probably do a video of that for me, negotiating on salary. I, I know people, I talk to people and now people put their stuff on Glassdoor, Redthor, and I think LinkedIn, I think LinkedIn's got base salaries in there. So now it's a, it's a lot easier, help me. I can always, and two is uh, Red Door, if it's a big company, they do it by company. A lot of times when people come in, they put their salary per company. So you can look at a company and a lot of times it has that position for that specific company. Oh, I could do that. I'll put that. You should, I could do that, Kev Tech. I'll put that on my list of things to do from a, um, from a video perspective. Uh, entry level, because there's three or four um, entry level jobs, analysts, GRC. Like I said, I do I do uh, federal stuff. Um, and two is we have a lot of grunt work, so that'll get you in. Like keeping Archer up to date, keeping, you know, um, Certain uh, programs up to date, uh, especially when you work for a large company. There's just uh, there's a ton of paperwork because we're doing policies and procedures, right? I talk to you a certain way because I know y'all tech guys, y'all about that tech life. But there's a other side where you I don't touch computers. I do policy, uh, procedures, uh, business continuity, dr uh, dr business continuity. That's really all paperwork. Right. Then when vendors come, when we get audited by uh, FISMA, IRS, OSHA, any of those guys, first thing they ask for is policies and procedures. That's our paperwork. Right. And I talked on that. And this has 20 uh, families, 20 security families. And I'm sure I do another video of that you need policies for those 21 families. You need procedures for 21, 21. Families. Since we report to a federal agency, my job mostly a lot of times is paperwork. Right. Because they want to say, uh, Kev Tech set up the Windows 10. I'm going to scan it from a FISMA perspective, DOD. It's going to tell me all the findings, right? So I'm, I, Kev, Tech, Kev Tech is super good. So he's going to have uh, Windows 10 has about 300 checks. Kev Tech sets it up, scan it. We got 10 checks. So now me and Kev Tech got to figure out, can we fix them? If we can't fix them, what's the mitigation? What's the mitigating control? If we can't do a mitigating control, me and him got to get management to sign off on it, right? Because when you do security, it's done as a program, right? When, when we talk about it here, we're talking about wireless LAN, right? When I talk to management, we talk to CISO. They don't really care about that. They want to go, okay, you got these findings here. You got these findings. There. From a total overall organization, when they go talk to the CEO, when the CISO talks to the CEO and the board of directors, they talk risk. They don't care how many findings you got in Windows 10 or 11. They don't care how many findings. What is the security posture of our overall company? If we get hacked, we got to prove we're not negligent, right? If you're doing HIPAA, there's four level of fines. If you're negligent, the last time I looked two years ago, I think it was $1,040 a record. If you got a million records at $1,000 a record, you had a billion dollars. 
right? So when you talk to management, that's a different conversation than us talking about technology, right? So I'm a tech guy, I love technology, but, but when me and the uh, security team get with the CSUN, we meet, we talk, okay, these are policies, this is the rating, but what is the security posture for over our organization? And we all know money's not infinite. So you got to pick which one you're going to secure, pick what you want to buy. And that's got to be the biggest bang for your security requirements, right? If all of these are, they call them category ones, that means they're open and they're being attacked in a while. Anything with cat ones, we got to close ASAP because that's been seen in a while by Verizon. Uh, Microsoft is a big, all those big security companies. They say, these are the stuff we see on our dashboards that's intact in a while, right? So. So when we talk security, like you got to start individually, like these are the devices, but then you got to roll that all that up and say, okay, what is the score of all those devices and what do we look? How do we look as an organization and where do we need to spend our money at? Right. Let's see. Yes. You know, something ourselves short to get in the door, but let's get all facts. Once you get in the door, though, one the thing, the thing that really when I got in DOD, I. Once I get out in the door and I tell people, like, it's the standard bell curve. I got 10% of the guys that are off the chart. These dudes are brilliant. They can't tie their shoes, but them dudes are brilliant, man. They coming out with algorithms I've never seen. And we moving 2 billion rows in four hours, stuff you never see. 20% of the people, especially in a government thing, DOD, I work with state agents, 20% of those people got hooked up. They ain't doing jack. They ain't very good. They got about six years to retirement, and they're just trying to get there. The rest of the people are just in the middle. So if you get in and you got skills and you're ready to work, you can get in there, and you're going to be okay. Like I said, you're not the, the top ten. I learned so much for those guys. I got cool with those guys. We talk. But a lot of those guys, top ten, they make killer money. But I was on Black Heights, sir. They making technical money. You make your money when you get into management, and you make your money like pre-sales engineers. They get part of the profits for when they actually uh, sell that to an organization and get it implemented, right? So they make big money. Why? A lot of those products are $50 million, $10 million, $30 million, right? Of course, that's over 10 years, but you, you get a piece of that each year in a lot of those companies as long as you stay when you implement, right? But we, this introduction to cybersecurity, we're going to touch on every event, touch on a lot of stuff. Um, like Kev Tech, I'm super excited about his uh, Azure class. I'm actually going to do an AW class, AWS class, similar to that. So I, I really like that. So this is the blur attack, and we talked about uh, network uh, blur. We talked about the evil tr twin access point up there. They make it look like the regular access point. Right. So when you log in the corporate log laptop login and Envil Twin, they think they're logging into the access point in the corporation. Right. So when they log into that, as soon as you put your username and password in there, because they got that fake startup page, I got it. Right. Then I'm going to hook you to the regular bar, but I already stole your credentials. Right. So, I, so I'm, I'm in, I'm in, impersonating you. Right. Then they got the rogue access point. I see this a lot on accident. People um, want to listen to music through their phone, right? So they set their phone up to connect to a uh, laptop or their or their personal iPad, right? But that rogue shows up when we listen for access points and be like, hey, we never seen this rogue access point. The cool thing is you can see when it's an accident because most rogue access points, they label on it, my homies connect or check us out or this their <laughs> home address, right? Now, if I see rogue access point and it's labeled some close to an access point in the company, right? I know you're trying to do something, right? Right. If it's the company name with a dot one instead of a underscore one, right? I know you're trying to do something, right? So I need to come see you. But most of the time, it's somebody just trying to listen to music or do something. But that's the evil twin and that's the rogue access point. All right. So those are the two big issues in, the, in that uh, thing. Once again, the uh, network blurred edges, right? Because access point weeks out two blocks away. It's over, over, over time. So intercepting wireless data, attacker can pick up RF signals from an open or misconfigured access point. 
Use the wireless LAN to read the data could yield significant information to attacker regarding the wire network. Uh, wireless replay attack, also known as hijacking attack. An attacker can capture transmitted wireless data, records it, and then sends it to sends it on the original receipt without the attacker presence being detected. So if I steal the information that had your username and password, right around at 10 o'clock, I replay that trans transmission, but it has my session ID. It could log me on as you, right? Wireless denial of service attack. It's called RF jamming. Attackers use intentional RF interference to flood with the RF spectrum with enough interference to prevent a device from communicating with the AP. Spoofing attacker crafts a fictitious frame that pretends to come from a trusted client when actually it comes from the attacker. Manipulation during uh, uh, field values. Attacker can send a frame with the duration field set to a high value, preventing other devices from transmitting for that time. From a wireless home attack, most home users fail to configure any security in their home. Network attackers can steal data, read wireless transmission, interject malware, or download harmful content. Let's see. Yep. Yep, KevTech has the uh, Azure class in there with the with the guy. Those are excellent classes. I'm an old guy. I still listen to them because I'm trying to get my Azure skills up. Um, once again, my main job, I am a security analyst, meaning I review software. I review technologies. If vendors, if vendors have some in AWS as an Azure, I have to review their setup. I got to review their networking setup. I got to make sure they do, do an encryption. I got to make sure if they're saving stuff in the database, that database has encryption at FIPS 140-2. So there's a lot of things I have to review in, in the cloud. A lot of our vendors who come pitching products to us, of course, as a service, all that stuff's in the cloud. So I need to understand it because I have to review it. And I got to sign off on security on that, right? Once again, I know the basics of database, how you secure it. I know the basics of a web server and app server. But how is Azure setting it up? Is Am I using Azure? Am I using platform as a service pass? Am I using infrastructure? Am I using SaaS software? So all of those stuff has different security vulnerabilities. So I have to stay up on all of that because I got to review security for those products that come into our organization, which is the cool thing because I always continue to learn. But a lot of times, too, it's like the cool thing is AWS and Azure. I got the security guys on the line and we just kind of walk through some security settings, some stuff I needed from them. Or if I was confused on stuff, I could always shoot. Uh, shoot their security team uh, questions and they would get back to me with answers. And that helps me learn, of course, their architecture. I do way more AWS than I do Azure, though. Uh, my video, Ryan, MVP from Microsoft. Oh, yeah, that, guy, that guy's good. I like him, too. But Ryan, I've looked at a number of their videos. Um, I know AWS has a, a security uh, certifications you can get. I don't know if Azure specific has Azure security one, but AWS has, so I, I actually probably sit for that. Hopefully, uh, I was going to say the end of the year, but hell, it's almost October. Mm. Yeah, everybody goes up to uh, Kev Tech. I mean, he's uh, definitely on it. Um, like I said, even though I'm old, he's, he's, he gives great information. Even at my age, technology stands, uh, moves at such a uh, super fast pace, uh, I'm saying ferocious pace, um, I always like to start with the basis. Kev Tech's going to give me the basis. A lot of that I'll be like, I already got. But some of that I'll be like, oh, I didn't know that, right? So if I'm always going to start with the basic, Kev Tech is there. His channel's giving out great information. Mm. Yeah, it's true. You got to learn. Uh, we always joke cloud is the next bag. So if I'm going to be uncomfortable, I need to uncomf be uncomfortable trying to get to the money. So I, I've been going with Azure and AWS. Uh Tiny's in there, CL. He's uh, we work together a lot, so we both trying to get on that cloud stuff. So, mm. yep, cloud. Yeah, I always say cloud is coming. Cloud is here. I almost feel like I'm late on the cloud sometimes. I mean, AW AWS been around for 14 years, I think. So, I mean, I think Azure's been around like 10, maybe a little less. Uh, AWS got like a 11 year head start. Jeff Bezos said he was surprised. He got like a 10 year head start on on the cloud before other people try to try to mimic it. 
What are your thoughts on adding smart TVs to an internal network? Uh, smart TVs is smart TVs are good. Um, I will make sure if you're in a corporation, you have a guest VLAN. I will hook the smart TVs to the guest VLAN, and they couldn't really get to my corporate. VLANs. I would always put covers over the, uh, the smart TV and I would make sure I, uh, a lot of them have firmware like computers now and you need to make sure that firmware is up to date on that day. But yeah, I would actually just make sure I would have it on a guest VLAN, make sure it's super hard to get over to my, my corporate side. Um, I would, from my network, especially if you're doing the cider stuff, I would never let that subnet get to my corporate subnet. Uh, the only way they would have to do it, they would actually have to hack my Cisco and reconfigure it so that subnet or VLAN could talk to the other one. But like I said, I always have a, a an internal guest VLAN just locked down for that particular pur purpose. Okay, if the cloud is here to stay, while well, I learned cannibal. Oh, the cloud is here. If you don't keep up with the cloud, you will be un unemployed in the next 10 years. Uh, I think 80% of the corporations in the tech next 10 years will be converted to the cloud and working in the cloud. I think a lot of them are talking about migrating to the cloud, figuring it out. They're moving their smaller stuff from a big corporation set to the cloud. All your uh, small to mid-sized companies, they're in the cloud. I did work 10 years ago at um, in Silicon Valley for a venture capitalist. They will not spin anything up on prem for you because if it fails, they just they don't want to they don't want to own hardware. It's too expensive, so they they just won't do it. So. So you need to get comfortable with the cloud. And it's the same, but it's, it's a little different. Let's see. Original, let's see where we are. Once again, IEEE recognized wireless transmissions, implemented several wireless security pro protections, left other vendors' uh, discretion. Protections are vulnerable. Uh, wired equivalency prize to web, uh, security protocol design ensure that only authorized party can view transmission, encrypts, uh, plain text in the ciphers, uh, secret key is shared between wireless client device and access points. The web, uh, can only use 64 and 128 bit numbers for encryption. Initializ initialization vector was only 24 bits. Short length makes this easier to break. Violates the cardinal rule of cryptography. Avoid a detectable pattern. Attackers can see duplication when start IVs and starts repeating. Right. So that was wired equivalent uh, privacy. Wi-Fi protective setup is an optional means for configuration and security of uh, wirelands. Too common in pin. Utilize pin printed on a sticker of a wireless router displayed to software wizard. User enter the pins and the security configuration automatically occurs. Push button method users push the button and security filters takes place. Design and implemented flaws. There are no lockout limits for entering pins. The last pin uh, character is only a checksum. The wireless router reports the validity of the first and second halves of the pin separately. MAC address filtering methods of controlling the wireless access point. Limit device access to access point. Uh, media access control filtering used uh, by nearly all wireless access vendors permits to block devices based on MAC address. Vulnerability of MAC address filtering. Address exchange in unencrypted format. Attackers can see address approved devices and substitute its own device. Managing a large number of addresses is challenging. So each network card has a MAC address, right? It's a unique kind of like a social security number of a driver's license. For that particular uh, thing, so this is usually how the MAC address look, organizational unit, then the individual address block. If there is on a, some of our uh, routers, we'll put a MAC address in, and only that wireless device can match with that MAC address. Right, so that's one level. But we all understand you can spoof the MAC address, there's a lot of things. So that's something low level you would set up as a light chat, right? Uh, we do security onion meetings. You got multiple layers of security. So we always going to do more than just the MAC address. That's going to be one, uh, versions of, of security. So, uh, this is, uh, I'm going back to check it out. Shout out to the cloud. 012. 
I think it's your. Oh, okay. I need to look up the helmet, the AZ500 for the security exam. Uh, somebody to Azure Sentinel, Azure Security. Yeah, Sentinel is actually the um, SIM for Azure. Uh, we actually looked at it. It sits on top. It gives you a lot more functionality. They have some called Azure Monitoring, which is a little cheaper that lets you get those logs. Then Azure uh, Sentinel sits on top of Azure Monitoring to actually take those logs and look for stuff. Um, look for different attacks in those logs. And it has intelligence included in Azure uh, Sentinel. Lots of uh, Roku TV take multiple access. Uh, true, true. True, true. I have uh, Eric Jens. Uh, I have AWS Practitioner, AWS Solution Talk, AWS. Oh, wow. Shout out to, to Erica. I might need to get in track with her. Uh, yeah, those are the those are huge. Uh, shout out to you. She's getting all the AWS stuff. She's um, taking the power move. So, yeah, I might have to uh, email Erica and bring you on my channel so we can chop it up about the AWS stuff. Probably my personal, man. Oh, man. Was that a uh, helmet? I saw that. I was going to leave the, the poly mask alone. <laughs> I was a little confused with that helmet. I, I'm going to let you handle that in the chat. <laughs> uh, thank you. Oh, Gay Bay in the house? Man, don't be afraid of cloud. It looks like, oh, shout out. Shout out to what Kev Tech said. Don't be scared of the cloud. We're going to learn it together. I'm going to get Erica Poly Math on the channel. She's going to give us some, some hits on the AWS cloud. Uh, <clears throat> Oh, thanks, Eric. I need to look into that fifty percent off an exam. Eric, I'm just tired. I'm in my fifties. I I need to I need to rest of twenty twenty two. But let me think about it. But shout out to Gay Bay in the house, man. Uh, once again, I, I like how you handled the guy on the other channel. Shout out to Gay Bay. Uh, would you recommend learning networking before a cloud or go right into networking? Uh, my two cents. I'm gonna let everybody try. I think you should learn networking before you go into cloud. To me, networking is the foundation of all that. Um, if, you, if you learn networking on prem, it could be um, general, it could be Cisco. Because when you go to AWS, and Erica could chime in, setting up a VPC is their networking, right? How do you set up your site, or how do you set up your subnets? How do you control your how do you control your subnets in AWS for that movement of traffic? How do you do security groups, right? I've done that all on prem, so I understand that. So when I move to the cloud, I'm comfortable with that. So I always state learn networking first. Before you go in the cloud, I'm and two is I'm changing um, Kev Tech, uh, Keep It Techy, Tech G. I'm an old school where I got my first degree in computer science. I've been a programmer for ten years. I was a DBA for five. I was a, a web admin for three. I did application servers. I did Apache Tomcat. So before I got in security, I had 15 years under my belt before I moved here. So I worked in all those domains. So I'm comfortable in all those domains. My weakest domain is probably networking, but but I've I've set up networks for small companies. I've I've I, and I've been on Linux. I've set up subnets. I control traffic between subnets. So I, I know what that looks like. I work with our Cisco team on site. So I, I validate that from a security perspective. So, so I'm comfortable with networking. So when I have to go to AWS and I'm like I said, interview Erica, we're going to break down a VPC. I know what those sub things are before we talk about VPC and, I, and I'm comfortable with those. So yes, Dave, long story short, I would recommend networking before I go to cloud. Uh, let's see. Uh, um, I need to know. Kev Tech need to know networking. Yep. Yeah, Erica, I missed my CSP 10 years ago by six questions and just never took it again. Shout out for that. I actually work with people with CISPs and CISMs. Uh, my compliance uh, director has CISM. Uh, stuff is doing. Shout out to Eric. I'm gonna have to track you down and uh, interview you. Uh, I'm with Kev Tech. Get the fundamentals before you go to the cloud. I need this today. <laughs> uh, good to see you. Whatever. So, uh, I mean, you don't know. I never do cloud first. Cloud. 
Okay, Clyde, Erica said in reverse. Yeah, um, I guess Gabe, and I'm just going to say this one more time, is I was just disappointed that he was that disrespectful and that belligerent in that live. My thing, like we talk about the sticks, the worst thing ever going to happen to me and you and Gabe is we just going to agree to disagree. I just thought he was really disrespectful to uh, keep it techie. I guess that's the only thing that really kind of kind of got me worked up. There's a thousand ways to skin a cat. Skin a cat. He was just super disrespectful on that live to people. I just thought that was just super out of pocket. That's kind of the only thing that kind of really rubbed me the wrong way. I'm going to disagree with a lot of people, especially at my age. And uh, Gabe, I think you're right. I have some old tendencies I need to get rid of. And that's why I like to hang out with people younger than me to kind of get me thinking differently. But I'm never going to be disrespectful, man. Even if I disagree, I we just don't disagree. Nothing, nothing big, nothing bad. I thought he was calling people out their name and talking about he was going to rip their resume up. All that I just thought was just out of pocket, gay. Yeah, that's my, that's my two cent on him. That was great pushback, man. That was good. Cause there was a lot of people on that live trying to learn. Uh, oh, Erica, cool. I, I understand. I, I, I like me and Erica, we, we disagree and I feel her. She thinks just go right in there and you, you just going to learn the cloud networking. You're going to get the cloud money, get an associate under you, and you can make a hundred. Yeah. Erica talking to money. So, you know, it's hard for me to argue with Erica. She's talking about six figures. Shout out to that. So, you know, I, I'm a, like I said, I'm old, so I like to get the fundamentals, man. Like you're on a basketball court, man. I got to work on my crossover between the legs before I try to dunk. But I understand what Erica said, and I'm processing what Erica said. <clears throat> All right, Erica, I'm going to come to your channel and check you out. I'm hoping you uh producing some videos. Uh, have a great weekend. Yeah, that, that, yeah, that was my, yeah, I'm with uh, Kev Tech on that. So that was my big thing. But I thought Gabe, hey, we needed Gabe in there because I would have been mad. But <laughs> I think Gabe handled it perfectly. Like I said, uh, I just I always want to be respectful uh, to people's ideas, even at my age. I need to be able to convince young guys of my, what I think is right, why, why I'm telling you to do it, and here's my backup documentation to back it up. And two is sometimes I like when people push back against me because if I can't validate my argument or show proof of my argument or thesis, and we're doing a PhD, if I can't prove my thesis, then it's not a good thesis, right? As a professor, I need to be able to back up what I'm telling you with documentations and examples of speed, performance of why I think this is the best way. And a lot of times, too, is a lot of my stuff, I just done it that way for 10 years. <laughs> that still doesn't mean the best, number one. I know it'll work, though. So if you got something better, some new technology, because there's always new technology, I'm, I'm opening up to listen to that, right? Because there's just too much technology in too many different ways how to do it. <laughs> Shout out to Eric. Uh, no videos yet after I clear. Okay, Erica. Shout out. We, we await your uh, videos. And uh, let me know if you be up for an interview. I can interview you, Kev Tech interview you, or there's a number of people here with channels. Um, so I'm sure we all would like to get you on it to see your uh, perspective on this industry. Like I said, cybersecurity, you got all the certifications. So I mean, we can definitely uh, chop it up, uh, take it. You know, once you pass your CSM, I know you're going to make it happen. Uh, to see it, service, service. Set identifier, the user supplied networking name of wireless network, usually progress so that any device can see it. The progress can be restricted. Some wireless security sources encourage users to configure their, their APs to prevent the broadcast of the SID. Not advertising SID only provides a weak degree of security. The SID can be discovered when transmitting other frames. May prevent users from being able to freely roam from one APK, AP covers to another. It's not always possible to turn off the seed. So the seed is when you look at your phone or your router, you can see the names of those access points. That's actually the seed and the name of those devices. I like to. What we do a lot of times is turn on the seed. You connect one time, save it, so it's always in your cache of devices. And we cut the seed off. So if you're coming in our area and you're looking for that seed, you can't see it. But once again, it's weak protection. That's layers. So 
you can get it. You can probably get it in your um, by the frame. But to do that, you're not a script kitty, right? We're moving up the ladder. If you're catching a frame and pulling the sit out of a frame of a wireless device, you're not a script kitty, right? You can do some damage. You have you have a skill set, right? So we know that if you can do that, right, we got a bigger problem in hand. A uh, unified approach to wireless security was needed. Uh, AWF and I began to develop security requirements. The standards today, and these are old, 802.11i and WAP and WAP2. Wi-Fi protective access, WPA, was introduced in 2003. Two modes, personal enterprise. Uh, both, ad both has encryption and authentication, right? I'm kind of flowing through these because it's from 2003, so right, we need to get a new century. Temporal key integrity, TKIP, temporal key uh, protocol encryption, use WPA, uh, use longer than 120 bit key than WEP, dynam dynamically generated uh, for each new packet, includes a message integrity check, a MIC designed to prevent man in the middle attacks, pre shared key. Uh, authentication for WPA personal comments by using a pre-shared key. After access point is configured, client device must have same access value entered. Key shared prior to the communication takes place. Using the uh, passphrase to generate encryption key must be entered on, on each access point and wireless device in advance. The device has the secret key or automatically authenticated by the access point. Uh, WPA, of course, have vulnerabilities. Key management, key sharing is done manually without security protection. Key must be changed on a regular basis. Key must be disclosed to guest users. Uh, passphrase, PS key passphrase is fewer than 20 characters subject to cracking. Right? So that's a big statement. A lot of people don't realize that. Passphrase is fewer than 20 characters are subject to cracking. Right, so you gotta have super long passwords. WPA2, second generation, 2004, IO211I, has two modes again, personal enterprise, addressed the major security areas, uh, worked on encryption and authentication. Yeah, I might have to look into that helmet. <clears throat> Advanced encryption standard AES, one of the few encryption sites that has not been hacked, to my knowledge. Let me throw that out. To my knowledge, has not been hacked. AES performed three steps on every block, 128 uh, bit of plain text. Within second step, multiple iterations of uh, perform. Bytes are substituted. The CCMP. Counter mode with cipher block chaining message authentication code protocol is the encryption protocol used for WPA2 specifies use in CCCM of the AES. The cipher block chaining message, uh, CBC MAC components provides data integrity authentication. Both the CMP and TKIP use 128 bit keys for encryption. Both methods use 64 bit bit for the MIG, right? And the MIG did the integrity check, right? So um, Erica put on there, she put on there the magic number, six figures. Uh, she says, get an associate under you and you can make 100,000 with those particular um, certifications. Um, I think that's what air that's the that's the game everybody's looking for. You gotta feel your path, what you're comfortable for. Um I'm still a fundamentalist, you know. I think you still need to work on the fundamentals of those um tools and services. So I A E I triple E eight oh two one talking about authentication. Originally developed for wired networks, provides greater degree of security for implementing port-based authentication. Blocks your tra traffic on a port-by-port basis until the client is authenticated. 
So step one, task, join the network. Step two, authenticator asks a uh, supplicant to verify identity. Three, the supplicant send identity to the authenticator, usually username, you know, password, to, or, or the key or the shared key if we're talking about encryption. Supplement is joined to the network. Authentication pass authenticators to the authentication server. The authenticator server verifies the identity. Step six, supplement is approved to join the network. All right, so those are the steps for a wired network for logging on from a port to port basis. Extensible authentication protocol, framework for transmitting authentication programs. Protocols define messages format, uses four types of packets, requests, response, success, failure. Common EAP protocol, Simplifies deployment from 802 by using Microsoft Windows login. Uh, creates encrypts channels between client and authenticated servers, right? So if you remember one of the um, SIG checks, right, was the EAP. You had to use EAP with TLS, right? So we're working up to that. But remember, from a SIG perspective, it required you to use that setting for your routers and Cisco communications inside. So in there, it says you had to use EAP TLS from a stick perspective. Protocol used for digital uh, certificates for authentication. The dot uh, protocol secure internal password for TLS uh, records. EAP files protocol securely tunnels any credential forms for authentication, such as password or token using TLS. Additional security properties. Other security steps can be rogue access point. Use the correct type of authentication protocol. I'm sorry, access point, access points, configuration settings, and wireless peripheral protection. So the role access point system detection and the role access point discovery tools for types of wireless probes can monitor wireless device probes, desktop access points, and dedicated. Once a suspicious signal is detected by a wireless probe, the information is sent to a centralized database for wireless LAN management system compared to a list of approved access point. Any device not on the list is considered a rolled access point. So once we get your access points on our list, if you spin up your phone and you set it up as a hotspot, that would come up as a rolled access point, right? Then security would come and visit you, right? I always kick back fundamentals. That's how I teach my stuff. That's facts, man. You never go wrong with fundamentals, man. Access uh, point types can be divided into fat or thin, controller or standalone, captive or portal access point, fat versus thin access points. Autonomous access points have the intelligence required to manage wireless authentication, encryption, and other functions for wireless devices. These are, they serve as fat access points. So it does all that stuff, right? That's what makes it a fat controller. Lightweight access points. Does not contain all the management configuration functions found in the file. They're called thin. Standalone versus controller. Controller AP, AP can be managed through a dedicated wireless LAN. The, uh, the WC is a single device that can be configured to settings uh, automatically dis distributed for our controller uh, access points. Other advantages of controller access points. Handoff procedures eliminated because all authentications are performed within the WLC. Uh, offer tools that provide for monitoring environment, providing information regarding the best locations for access points, wireless access uh, configuration settings, and power settings. So that shows you the access points. And if you go through a company, you will see them or apartment building or whatever. You see those listed. You see those hanging actually on the uh, ceiling. A lot of times, I actually like to hide them in the ceiling, but when you hide them in the ceiling, of course, you uh, block some of the effectiveness because it's not a straight sight. But, you know, when I go around the office, they have the access points on the ceiling. You can see them with the uh, little antennas. Okay, all good, Tech. Thanks for stopping by, Kev Tech. Appreciate it, man. We about done wrapping up. <laughs>
captive uh, portable access points used as a standard web browser to provide information, give wireless users the opportunity to agree or disagree with the policy or present valid credentials. So you see those a lot. At least says, you know, if you get hacked on this <laughs> on this access point, we're not responsible, <laughs> right? Other access configuration settings are designed to limit the spread of the wireless signal so that the minimum amount of uh, signal extends past the physical boundaries of the enterprise accessible to outsiders, site survey, and in-depth examination and analysis of a wireless LAN site. So you get your site survey. And once again, we saw the diagram. We don't want that uh, signal uh, being too strong so you can catch it two blocks away, right? Signal strength, some access points allow power level adjustments. Reducing the power allows less signals to reach outsiders. The spectrum selection, some access providers have the ability to adjust frequency spectrum setting, frequency band, channel selection, and channel width, which is on a lot of those. So dial. Antenna should be located near the center of the coverage, placed out in the wall to reduce signal obstruction. Deter theft. If the possible, the AP to access should be positioned so that a minimum amount of signal reaches the security perimeter of the building. Vulnerability in wireless mice, keyboards. Um, these are wireless peripheral protection because, you know, wireless mice and keyboard actually could be hacked. One attack could let a threat actor inject mouse movements or keyboard to a nearby antenna up to 100 yards away. Protection includes updating and replacing any vulnerable devices. Switch to a more fully tested Bluetooth mice and keyboard. Substitute with the uh, wireless mouse. So that's it, fellas. Um, I think that's that's it for the chapter today. We hit wireless pretty hard. <laughs> the chat was on fire. I appreciate it. Uh, if you got any questions, ask them. If not, and I'm going to go ahead and end it. I'm going to enjoy the stream. Um, two is I'll see if I can get, get a little time for Erica to jump on <laughs> to uh, this. Uh, wireless, like I said, is just a part of cybersecurity. One other, I think we have uh, eight eight other chapters left, so eight weeks of this and <laughs> different level of things. Uh, once again, coming up, I'm gonna do the autonomous uh, semi. Uh, I'm gonna do like Kev said, I'm gonna take notes, figure out the basic things you can to actually get you started, uh, what position you can get inside uh, cybersecurity. Um, I'm going to reach out to my SOC guys. I don't do a lot of SOC work. SOC is sort of security operations center where they look at attacks, they look at logs, they look at inventory, they look at a variety of things in the SOC. So I, like I said, I'm going to reach out to some of my SOC people, uh, see what they're looking for. Um, in there, in that operation, and probably that probably would probably be the best place for um, socks because most socks are twenty four seven. If you work for a major company, um, so I definitely try to reach out. I appreciate that blind guy, his wife, and their life. If that's it, I'm out. Everybody have a nice weekend. Uh, hopefully, I'm gonna go live and do an interview on Tuesday. That's my goal. Um, email. Professor Black Ops at gmail.com. Look at my community tab. My email's in there. Reach out to me. I'm out. Everybody have a good weekend.